Hi, this is Kim Curtis. I'm a professor in civil engineering at Georgia Tech. I want to thank the organizers of this conference and the moderators of this session for inviting me to present my ideas on advancing sustainability in concrete infrastructure. Before we get started on the talk, I want to just uh, comment on the ubiquity of cement-based materials. As a society, we rely on concrete more than ever in all of our history to provide things like energy, whether it be hydropower, nuclear power, uh, clean water, also to convey our dirty water, and also to transport goods and people. Uh, so we use more concrete actually per capita than any other time in history. You can see here in the 1970s, we were consuming concrete at a rate of about one ton per person per year. And if you think about a ton of concrete as being about the size of a US dis dishwasher, you can imagine then three tons per person per year, how much concrete we're consuming. Uh, so I will argue in today's talk that we need to increase the rate of innovation if we're going to continue to meet societal needs for infrastructure in the most sustainable and economical manner possible. And I'm not the only one who thinks so. Bill Gates, you can see his quote here, he argues that concrete rather than silicon is the most important human-made material. So before I get into the talk a little bit more, I want to remind you a little bit about how cement is made. So currently, because we consume so much of it, Portland cement and its manufacturing process accounts for about 5% of anthropogenic CO2 emissions. Uh, so I'm going to go through a little bit of the schematic to explain to you where those CO2 emissions come from. So the raw materials that are used to produce Portland cement um, largely contain limestone as well as some other minerals. It's the limestone though that when it goes into this kiln uh, decomposes to form lime and also CO2. This CO2 accounts for about 60% of the anthropogenic CO2 that's associated with cement manufacture. The other 40% of the CO2 arrives from the arises from the fuel that's used in order to create the temperatures of up to about 1450 degrees C inside of the hottest part of the kiln that are needed to complete the clinkering reactions. The back end of the kiln come the calcium silicates and calcium aluminosilicates that we associate with ordinary Portland cement clinker. In modern cement, these are blended not only with gypsum, but also with limestone on up to 5% in order to produce a finished cement. So why am I talking about cement rather than concrete? Uh, we know that cement is an important ingredient in concrete, but it comprises only about 12% of the concrete by mass. Uh, but it accounts for about 94% of the embodied energy and about the same amount of embodied greenhouse gases. So for that reason, cement plays an important role in terms of creating a more sustainable material. So there are lots of options for improving sustainability in cement, and this has been a focus for the industry since the first energy crisis in the 1970s. Uh, part of that focus has been looking at clinkering operations, reducing the size of the kiln, and also looking at alternative fuel sources, uh, including recycled materials. Uh, today, kilns are much smaller than ever in the past, decreasing residence time within the kiln. Uh, and we're also using uh, recycled fuels as well as um, alternate sources of energy are being explored, including concentrated solar. So look for a lot of new developments in that area in the coming years, as well as also direct carbon capture uh, through the CO2 emissions that are coming out of the kiln. But my talk today is gonna be more focused on the materials, specifically on the feedstock materials and focusing a lot on this limestone content, trying to adjust that downwards in order to reduce the amount of CO2 evolved in the kiln. Uh, and also looking at increasing the blending of limestone and other minimally processed minerals, including supplementary cementitious materials into our finished cements. I think those are two of the important strategies for improving sustainability in concrete. So the outline of my talk today acknowledges that there's been a lot of progress in terms of more efficient cement and concrete production. And we've also really managed to increase service life. Durability is very important to realizing our sustainability goals because it means that we replace infrastructure less frequently. A lot of these changes have been realized in the last few decades, but I will argue that important non-incremental innovations are continuing to be necessary in order to meet our goals for sustainable development. So my talk today is really gonna focus on three areas that I think are critical to achieving these. One is variations in cement composition, including using alternative cements and other binder chemistries. Looking at minimally processed materials, including SCMs and alternate sources of those, 
as well as what I'll call mineral fillers, uh, materials like limestone. So intergrinding limestone in the finished cement and reducing the amount of limestone that's calcined to produce cement. And then I'm gonna throw in a uh, performance-based specification. In order to realize these objectives, I really see a, a, an important shift needed in the way that we specify um, our materials and also our concrete. So let me start talking about alternative cement-based materials uh, by describing what they are. Uh, so there's been a bit of an evolutionary process in terms of defining them. And we think of them today as being anything that's essentially not a Portland cement, um, independent of how they're produced, whether they're calcined, clinkered, or chemically activated. And so according to an ACI technical working group, we can think of an alternative cement as any inorganic or mineral cement that's used as a complete replacement for Portland cement or blended hydraulic cements. And this is important. Uh, we think of it as not being covered by applicable standards for Portland or blended hydraulic cements. This concept becomes really important in the third part of my talk. I'm showing here just some pictures of ACMs to try and demystify them. Um, we've got calcium aluminate cements, calcium sulfo aluminate cements, and then also magnesium phosphate and chemically activated um, aluminosilicate binders. They don't look so much different from Portland cement. They are produced, however, um, quite differently in some cases. Uh, so there are some ACMs that are produced through clinkering operations quite similar to Portland cement, but typically at lower temperatures. And these include calcium aluminate and calcium sulfo aluminate cements. Other ACMs are produced through calcining. And so this is typically at a much lower temperature than is required for clinkering. And an example here would be a magnesium phosphate cement. Others are not clinkered at all. Uh, and they're produced by mixing materials together and creating a, a direct chemical reaction. And these include alkali activated aluminosilicates. In this case, some of the precursor materials such as uh, calcine clays may be subject to calcination. Uh, but other materials like fly ash or slag, which can be activated, uh, are not calcined at all. And so you can imagine by reducing or even eliminating the heat processing, uh, you can significantly reduce the CO2 uh, embodied in these materials because you essentially eliminate that or significantly reduce that fossil fuel contribution. So why have we been interested in ACMs? Well, traditionally, they've been used largely for repair applications. Here I'm showing an example of where they're used uh, for repair in, in Alaska. Some of these ACMs can set in very harsh conditions, including cold weather. Uh, so they've been very, very useful for repair. They've got very high early strength, uh, and so they can um, be used for rapid replacement of pavements, say, over a weekend. These are some pavements in California. They've got decades of experience using ACMs to replace um, lane miles of pavement over a two-day two period. Uh, they're also used in the Midwest. This is an ACM pavement in Chicago that was used to replace an elevated uh, pavement structure. Uh, they also can have low heat of hydration, so they can be used potentially for mass concrete. Some have really enhanced durability in very aggressive environments, um, including fire resistance. Um, and also because of their rapid setting, some are used in new construction methods, like in 3D printing. What I wanna highlight is that all of these ACMs have different properties. So ACM is not a uniform class of material. So why else are we interested in ACMs? And in the context of this talk, we're really interested in them because of their potential to be a sustainable construction material. Um, these bars here show the emissions embodied in uh, a ton of clinker um, for Portland cement compared to different ACMs. The blue part of the bar is the part associated with the pyro processing or the thermal treatment. And then the yellow part is associated with the raw materials. And you can see here the chemically activated materials or, or something like a geopolymer has no pyro processing. Uh, so it represents a very large reduction in embodied CO2 for that reason. Others use various combinations of savings in materials and in processing to reduce the overall CO2 emissions. And we can typically see savings of between 20 and 40%, depending on the ACM composition and processing. Another potential benefit is that some of these ACMs possess really high compressive strength. And so here you can see strength development for a range of ACMs compared to OPC in the black bars. Uh, why is strength important for sustainability? Well, you can imagine for carrying a specific load, if you have a higher strength material, you could potentially use a lower, 
a smaller cross section, which could significantly decrease the volume of concrete that you need uh, to support a specific load. Some of these ACMs, as I mentioned, also have enhanced durability in environments like sulfate attack, and so that can lead to a longer service life, which is also important because it limits the amount of uh, repair and also reconstruction that's necessary, and that represents important uh, contributions to sustainability as well. So I want to go back to composition here for a second. We talked a, a bit about pyroprocessing, but uh, I want to look specifically at how composition plays into these CO2 savings. And specifically, I want to look at the calcium oxide content. Remember, calcium oxide was uh, derived uh, through thermal processing. It's the decomposition of the calcium carbonate uh, that then gives up the CO2 and produces lime. So I just want to draw your eye here to the yellow bar in each of these compositional bars for OPC compared to a range of different ACMs. And you can see they're all quite different. Uh, there's no you know, single ACM composition, even within a specific class of material. But what you can appreciate is that the amount of calcium oxide and therefore the amount of calcium carbonate used to produce each of these cements is significantly lower than an ordinary Portland cement. So it's pretty clear that we can expect to see reductions in embodied CO2 through a combination of changes in composition and uh, reductions in the amount of energy required to process the material. And just a reminder here that because we do have differences in composition, we're also going to have differences in reaction products. So you can see the hydration reactions for ordinary Portland cement here. Uh, and then you can see for each of these different ACM classes, we can expect to see some different hydration products. And so that means that we kind of have to relearn everything that we know about how concrete behaves if we're going to be constructing with these ACMs. And that can present a challenge into translating their use as a direct replacement for ordinary Portland cement. And so indeed, when we surveyed states around the US in a recent Federal Highway Administration project, that was one of the significant barriers that had been identified. Uh, in this survey, about half of the states that responded said that they had used ACMs and about half had not. Of those that had used ACMs, they had used a range of different ACMs, including uh, the calcium aluminate, calcium sulfoaluminate, uh, the alkali activated systems or geopolymers, magnesium based cements, and also polymer modified cements. But of the states that responded about barriers to ACM usage, you can see that a lot of the concerns have to do with performance and specifically long term performance and an inability to be able to take that leap because of the risk associated uh, with how these materials would perform in the long run. So part of the contributions of our work um, in this Federal Highway project uh, were to better understand what the long-term behavior of these ACMs could be expected to be, and which ACMs we would recommend for applications in different environments. I know this is only a 30-minute talk, so I just want to give one example uh, that highlights both the ACM variability and opportunities for its use. So here I'm highlighting some expansion data from ASR testing. Alkali silica reaction is an expansive reaction that can happen in concrete. It's a reaction of the aggregate in combination with alkalis in the pore solution. Uh, and so it manifests itself in, in terms of a length change or an expansion that can lead to cracking. Uh, in this case, we did a two-year study using on uh, concrete prisms under a standard ASTM 1293 test. And I'm showing here just as a control an ordinary Portland cement in the black line. And you can see this Portland cement um, in, the, in combination with a reactive aggregate that we chose experienced about 0.2% expansion at 24 months um, and about you know, a little bit um, less than 0.15% at 12 months. Uh, a common way to mitigate alkali silica reaction expansion is by combining ordinary Portland cement with fly ash. And you can see that behavior here in the dashed black line. And you can see that we can significantly reduce the ASR expansion of this aggregate by blending with fly ash. Now let's look at the ACMs. Um, here you can see that we had two ACMs that did not do very well. At 24 months, they had similar expansion to OPC, suggesting that this is just sort of the intrinsic expansion of the aggregate. But the rate of the, rea the reaction was a little bit more aggressive with these two ACMs. But I do want to point out that we had a couple of cements, two CSA cements, that actually had very similar response to the OPC with fly ash. And this is the typical standard for how we mitigate ASR today. Um, I also want to highlight that we had several ACMs that actually performed better than the fly ash. Uh, and so what this slide is meant to represent is that, uh, one, the 
performance of ACMs can be quite variable, but for specific applications, they can afford some important advantages, both in terms of the initial embodied CO2 and energy reductions, uh, but also in terms of extending service life. And so I do think ACMs are an important strategy for meeting sustainability goals in the future. All right, next I wanna shift our focus a little bit and talk about supplementary cementitious materials, including new sources, as well as um, limestone fillers. Um, I'm gonna collectively call these minimally processed minerals. And so uh, first, what are SCMs? Well, we can think of SCMs as materials that can be used as a partial replacement for cement. So we directly replace the clinker in concrete. Again, we're addressing that high energy intensive component, uh, the clinker that's produced in the kiln and replacing it with a more minimally processed mineral. And so we can see a direct correlation between the replacement level and reductions in CO2 and embodied energy. Um, how do SCMs react? Well, typically these are going to be finely divided uh, mineral materials that contain some component of amorphous or, or largely amorphous siliceous or aluminosiliceous uh, material. So the SCMs react with Portlandite or calcium hydroxide. This is essentially a byproduct of the Portland cement hydration reaction. Uh, this reaction occurs relatively slowly with most SEMs, and the result is calcium silicate or calcium aluminosilicate hydrates uh, that are the strength giving phases in uh, concrete. These materials not only give strength, but because they form slowly with SCMs, they also tend to densify the structure. So we end up with a structure that has smaller and more discontinuous pores. And what that means is that we can expect to see uh, decreases in permeability. So as a result, SCMs tend to increase concrete durability and we have longer lifespans, which is also a really important component uh, for sustainability. For SEMs, ideally we want a, a consistent, you know, not variable, and a local supply of SEMs that can reliably improve performance. Local supply is important because we really don't, as a rule of thumb, want to transport uh, materials on this scale more than about 50 miles uh, from where they're going to be uh, produced to where they're going to be used. That's a good rule of thumb to use. Traditionally, fly ash has been the most utilized SCM. It's been used in concrete since the 1940s. So fly ash is derived from coal combustion processes. Uh, here you can see a, an image of a fly ash particle. Um, they tend to be spherical, so they help to improve the workability in concrete when they replace angular cement grains. Um, and they're commonly used at about 20 to 40% replacement of cement in concrete. However, um, there are some changes in the fly ash availability in recent years. Uh, because fly ash is derived from coal and we see that coal combustion is decreasing in favor of the use of natural gas and um, other sources for energy, including renewables, there can be some inconsistency in the availability of fly ash, uh, particularly in North America. And so that's increased interest in identifying alternative SCMs that can be used uh, to supplement the market for fly ash. So what are some potential alternative SCM sources? Well, one that's gathering a lot of attention is the potential opportunity to reutilize fly ash that has been stored in ponds um, across the United States. So here you can see um, a number of uh, actually hundreds of fly ash ponds that are going to be um, uh, subject to EPA regulation. Uh, new EPA regulations are saying that fly ashes need to be stored in a uh, more secure manner, as this is going to require that the fly ash be moved from current containment ponds into lined storage or landfill facilities. And this is going to affect about 90% of our existing fly ash storage ponds, or something like 2 billion tons of ash. I'm told that this is about a 100 year supply of fly ash. So the question is, is can these stored ashes uh, meet our needs in the concrete industry. Um, and so the question is, you know, how much do they really change during storage? And are they compositionally similar to freshly produced ashes? Um, I should acknowledge that sometimes these are commingled with ashes that do not meet ASTM C618 specifications for fly ash, meaning that they do not meet standards on things like LOI. They may also be commingled with other coal combustion byproducts. So that does make it challenging to reuse these materials. 
Um, in my group, we have looked at a number of different um, weathered fly ash sources. So these are fly ashes that were taken from ponds. And you can see that they do retain some of the similar microstructure to what we saw with freshly produced fly ash. We see these spherical particles, but we also do see some agglomerates. Uh, in a study that we published in the American Concrete Institute Materials Journal, uh, we compared the performance of a number of these different weathered fly ash sources through a strength activity index. In this case, we take about 20 per, actually we take 20 percent of reclaimed ash and substitute that for Portland cement. And according to the standard in C618, we're trying to reach 75 percent of the compressive strength of an ordinary Portland cement mortar. And you can see here that the majority of the weathered ashes were able to meet the standard. Uh, we had four that were unable to meet the standard. Um, they were a little bit below that 75 percent um, strength limit, uh, but we were able to beneficiate them using a more complex process so that they could potentially be used in concrete. And so that's going to be a focus for additional research is trying to understand you know, which ashes can be used and what are the best avenues for beneficiation in order to meet our needs in this arena. Another important potential alternative source for SEMs is a growing interest in using calcined clays. I'm borrowing these top two images from Karen Scrivener, who's been a big proponent for this idea in a, for a long time. And she will argue that the amount of fly ash, slag, and silica fume produced uh, each year is very, very small compared to the amount of calcined clay that's available. If you look here um, at the global map, everywhere in green and yellow shows where clays can be available for use. And so this really meets my objective of having locally available SCMs. Uh, and so how are calcined clays produced? Well, essentially we take clay sources here. I'm looking at a byproduct uh, source in California. So this is you know hundreds of millions of tons of clays that have accumulated in this industrial facility. Um, over the last uh, generation. We can then thermally process any type of calcined clay at temperatures significantly lower than are required to produce Portland cement in order to activate them so that they become pozzolanic or, or reactive in a cementitious system. And so today we purchase these materials as metakaolin or a, it's a specific type of calcined clay and they're commonly used to replace about 10% of the cement in concrete. And so people are asking, you know, can we use more of this calcined clay? And one strategy for using more calcined clay is actually to blend it with limestone fillers. So limestone fillers um, are increasingly commonly used. They've been available in Europe as Portland limestone cement. So Portland cement or part of the Portland cement clinker is replaced with limestone. So rather than using it all in the feedstock material, we blend it um, with a clinker on the back end. This has been a common practice in Europe since the 1960s and was approved in the US in 2012. Uh, so currently about 5% uh, of ordinary Portland cement can be uncalcined limestone. There's also a new class of cements, um, ASTM C595 type 1L cements or Portland limestone cements can replace up to 15% of the clinker uh, with cement. And so you can imagine if we're directly replace, I'm mean, sorry, with limestone, if we're directly replacing 15% of the cement with limestone, which is not calcined, you can see that there's a, going to be a, a directly related reduction in embodied greenhouse gases. Now, because the limestone is minimally reactive, what we can do is we can combine the limestone with calcined clay, which is highly reactive, to create a synergy. And that can offset any dilution effect from the limestone. Uh, and also ends up giving very high strength and durability, while also increasing the amount of savings uh, in greenhouse gases and energy. So you can see the accumulated combination of limestone cement with uh, 10 percent metakaolin and also 30 percent metakaolin uh, can create um, big savings in greenhouse gases. At the same time, if we compare strength development, uh, here you can see we've got Portland cement in the black, our Portland limestone cement, which is very similar to Portland cement in terms of its strength development in the black bars. You can see that if we um, use the right admixtures to disperse uh, the clays well, we can achieve significantly higher strengths with the, um, these limestone calcine clay or what's called LC3 cements. And together they can replace up to 50% of the cement. So I really do think that's an important strategy for the future. So finally, I wanna talk about performance-based specification. So as you've seen, there's a lot of new ideas in terms of um, cement composition, and it's very different from what we saw in the 1940s. 
Uh, we're all familiar with types one through five cement. This is the ASTM C150 standard from uh, 1941. And you can see some very familiar tables to those of you who've looked at the specification recently. They're largely based on prescription. That is, what is the composition of the cement in terms of its oxide analysis and some other factors. Today, that standard still exists. It started to include some more performance-based specification. Uh, and more directly, we're moving into some new specifications like the C595 that I mentioned before that includes that Portland limestone cement, the type 1L cement. Uh, but we're also seeing this new standard, relatively new standard, C1157, which is a performance specification, specification for hydraulic cement. Here you can see that type 1 its analog here is a type GU or general use, but there's also moderate heat, moderate sulfate resisting, high early strength, low heat, and high sulfate resisting cements that are available. This decouples performance from composition and it allows for a broader range of mineral compositions in the cement. And it really opens the door for the adoption of new materials. Um, here again, you can see the C150 specifications really rely on prescription today. Uh, but the 1157s rely more on performance, like compressive strength, heat of hydration, uh, mortar bar expansion when subjected to sulfate attack, and so forth. And so as a result, industry uh, is responding. So this is a pretty exciting article that came out just recently uh, that demonstrates that Argos uh, is introducing two different commercial LC3 cements, one as a general use and one as a high early strength application. So I think we're going to start seeing um, more of this type of news in the future as we begin to capitalize on things like carbon markets uh, and trying to meet various sustainability goals. We're also seeing some changes in terms of SCMs. I know that a lot of people are hard at work at modernizing um, C618 to specifically um, endorse uh, potentially other um, SCM sources like reclaimed fly ashes and ground bottom ash. Uh, there's also a new guide, a relatively new guide, uh, to the evaluation of alternative um, supplementary cementitious materials for use in concrete. So this creates a pathway where they can be adopted for use. And so why are we seeing this change? You know, some could argue that the way we were producing concrete wasn't necessarily broken, but it really wasn't meeting our sustainability objective. So you could argue that it was becoming obsolete. And so we're seeing this big shift to performance-based specifications so that owners can get what they're paying for. They're not paying for a specific composition, they're paying for a rate of strength gain maybe, or, or also durability, or maybe both. And this allows them to directly specify that. It also fosters innovation by allowing contractors to produce concrete properties with a variety of different materials and mixture designs. And overall, this in can increase the quality and also contribute to sustainability while potentially lowering project costs uh, by allowing a pathway for innovations to leave the lab and come into practice. Recently, um, as part of a uh, Georgia DOT project, we surveyed through AASHTO different states on their use of performance-based specifications. And we were happy to see that 70% of states had some experience with using performance-based specifications for pavements and also for concrete quality. So this is definitely something that's coming our way. Um, but there are some barriers. Um, there's some difficulties with enforcement. There's concerns about how much money this is going to cost and also time. And this is largely surrounding the increased amount of testing that's required. So we do need to measure performance. And so uh, measurements of performance require laboratory testing, which costs both money and potentially time. So how do we get around those roadblocks? Well, I could argue that part of it derives from the lack of interplay between our existing specifications. So there's a variety of different agencies that have their own materials and concrete design specifications. And there's a need to modernize each of those. So we saw how ASTM is working to modernize its specifications. There's also a need to harmonize the interaction between them. You can see we've got some conflict in the way these gears are turning into one another. So uh, what ASTM does needs to influence what ASHTO does and what ASHTO does needs to influence what ACI does and the state requirements and so forth. Um, ACI recently funded um, a group of people. I was lucky to be among these. Uh, we created a final report looking at 
any existing conflicts in material specification for durability among the various ACI committee documents. And we were surprised with the number of conflicts that we found. We've been able to produce a document uh, that we presented to the SDC at, at ACI, and recently we'll be publishing in Concrete International that highlights a path forward for harmonizing the standards. I'll also argue that we can potentially reduce testing uh, by differentiating between known and unknown and consistent and inconsistent sources of new materials and put the testing money where it belongs on emerging sources where we have less of a history. Uh, we also can harness things like data analytics, including machine learning, so that we can learn from historical data sets, which can also reduce the amount of testing that we need to do and potentially also the test duration. And in turn, this will reduce effort and cost. In summary, um, I started with the idea that this necessity and ubiquity of concrete infrastructure creates a huge opportunity for increasing innovation to address sustainability. Environmental impact is really a function of the population which is growing, the affluence which is also growing. And so we need to increase technology in order to diminish environmental impact. Only by increasing technology, using materials that through technology and innovation have lower embodied CO2 and lower embodied energy, can we reduce environmental impact? And so this can be done by using um, new cement chemistries, blending cements with SCMs and other minerally processed minerals. But the way to get this to happen is through policy. We need to adjust our specifications so that we can accelerate the translation of this new technology into practice. Finally, I need to acknowledge um, my students who and postdocs who actually did this work. Um, I'm really pleased to acknowledge Prashant Alapati, who did all of the work on ACMs, Oljan Kenbeck, Daniel Benkesser, and Benaz Zarabath, who contributed the work on SCMs and limestone. And on performance-based specifications, it's the work of Renee Rios and Francesca Lali. And we need to acknowledge our sponsors gratefully as well. I really appreciate the opportunity for being here today, and thank you for your attention.